Hey there, everyone. My name is Russ Rutledge. I'm the Director of Developer Collaboration at Nike. I'm very excited to talk with you today about getting started with InnerSource at your company. Now, what I'll share with you is a combination of my own experience with InnerSource at Nike, and then also things that I've heard and learned from other companies that participate in the InnerSource Commons. I've been involved with there with a few years. Uh, now, just a little bit about how I got my start in InnerSource. Uh, I've been involved in InnerSource for about five years now, and it sort of was something that we stumbled on accidentally at Nike. I was running a software team, and we ended up having need of InnerSource uh, in order to serve our customers. Our team produced a continuous deployment, continuous delivery pipeline for Nike's websites. We were a very, very small team and had many, many internal customers. Uh, so many that we couldn't keep up with all the functionality that was needed. And so in order to meet this need, we had the idea to form an internal community of contributors so that when our team couldn't produce code fast enough, the other teams who needed it could use their engineering resources not to build their own deployment pipeline, but use that same engineering time uh, that they would have to spend anyway and contribute to our repositories, contribute to our deployment pipeline. Now, we hadn't heard of InnerSource. Uh, we called it community development, but we sort of organically discovered all the principles of InnerSource that allowed us to scale to be very, very effective. With just three full-time engineers on our team, we were able to serve literally hundreds of internal JavaScript projects at Nike. It was amazing. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, we had some statistics show that verifiably over 90% of all commits to JavaScript projects at Nike were going to projects that flowed through our deployment pipeline. Uh, now this incredible success led me to start advocating that other central projects, that they also run themselves in this way. And that eventually translated to where my full-time job was teaching inner source, teaching collaborative behavior and activity. And that's still what I'm doing. Been there for two and a half years. So I've had some hands-on personal experience, had time teaching others, uh, time to look back. And what I've got for you here today is if you're just starting with InnerSource at your company, I'm going to give my best reflection and advice you know, from someone that's been on the road for a while uh, and been connecting with others who have been uh, on that road as well. Now, I, I love this imagery, this idea of a road, because this is going to be a journey that you're going you're gonna to take. Uh, InnerSource is a, a journey. It's a cultural journey. Uh, a cultural change. Now, within any, any journey, the single best thing that you can do for this journey to be successful is to know where you want to arrive. Now, I'll submit to you, InnerSource is the journey. It's not necessarily the destination. Hey, InnerSource should be a means to an end. InnerSource should be bringing you some benefit that you want. It should be overcoming some pain uh, some challenge that you currently have. And it's really, really important that you understand what is that benefit that you want to get, what is that pain that you want to overcome, and that you identify that up front. And here's why. Uh, there's different types of inner source interactions, and uh, we'll go into some detail there in just a little bit. And different types of interactions tend to yield different types of benefits and also different challenges. If you know what are the benefits that you're trying to achieve, <clears throat> then you can focus on the types of inner source interactions that are more likely to produce those benefits. And I'll give you a way to decide that here as the, as the presentation goes on. But number one, understand what you want to get out of it. That's going to be very important. But let me give you an idea of a little bit of what I'm talking about. Uh, these are just some sample goals that I've heard people talk about that I imagine that people want related to why they're going on an inner source journey. Uh, maybe for you, it's really important to unlock and encourage innovation from your engineering population. You know, you want people to not be constrained to commit to just projects they own, but if they have an idea anywhere in the company that they are unlocked uh, to commit and share that idea through a code contribution, and that's that's great. Maybe you feel that inner source and uh, opening things up, uh, enabling people to contribute where they have passion and energy, maybe that will unlock better quality of life for your engineering population, for your developers. Uh, that's, that's definitely a valid goal. You may want uh, projects to be more widely shared. 
when a particular team figures out and has a coding solution to something that's able to be shared broadly and contributed to uh, so it can work uh, throughout the company. You can reduce engineering uh, isolation, engineering silos, and get things shared more broadly. Uh, maybe that's your result you're going for. Perhaps you have some key initiative that you really want to be accelerated, but you can't just necessarily throw more people on the same team at it. But through Intersource, you can have folks on other teams contributing and advancing that central initiative uh, in an open and coordinated way. Uh, and then my last example here, you might have instances where important projects are blocked, waiting for some dependent feature to get shipped. And while that team is blocked, they can't make progress on their mainline work. And so you want to enable them through Intersource to unblock themselves through submitting code to the thing that's blocking them uh, that gives the functionality that they need so that then they can go on uh, with their main roadmap. You know, maybe, maybe you want Intersource to enable results like that. And there may be other challenges you're trying to overcome, other benefits besides the one here, ones here. These are just some examples, but there's some common ones that I've, that I've heard before. Now, it's not like one of these is any better than the other. All of them are valid. There's no, uh, what's the right one? Which one should I pick? You need to pick the right one for you, given the business objectives that you have, given the engineering challenges uh, that you want to overcome. Uh, but you should know what you're going for. And what I'm going to share with you is then how you can map that to where to start your inner source journey. Now, in order to draw that map for you, I need to introduce just a little bit more terminology that allows to categorize types of inner source interactions. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> now, this uh, dimension of categorization that I've drawn here is related to the way that teams that are participating in inner source, teams that are participating in, in this cross-team code collaboration, uh, this categorization shows how they feel about the project they're collaborating on in relation to their daily work. And the first category I'll say is, is this inner source project, is this software, uh, is it their mainline project? I mean, maybe uh, by mainline project, I mean, this is like the reason that they're getting paid at the company to work. This is a project that their team owns, their mainline daily job is, is shipping, the, sh shipping this particular software project. That would be someone's mainline work. I'd categorize it that way. Uh, for example, at your company, uh, you might have a team that produces some type of API service that exposes some of your business data internally to other teams. So that API service we call um, a, a team that works on it, that API service would be their, their mainline work. Now, that's different than what I'll call a support project. Uh, a support project uh, in, in, in this, uh, this way of categorizing is something that is necessary for me to get my mainline project done, but it in itself is, is not my mainline project. And the example I'll give here comes from my own history that I shared earlier, uh, a deployment pipeline, right? Uh, a deployment pipeline is, is, can be a software project, and it's absolutely necessary. If, if my mainline project were shipping an API service, I need a way to deploy it. So absolutely necessary, but the deployment pipeline is not my mainline project. It's, it's not the reason I'm coming and getting paid, it, but it does support my mainline daily work. So that's a support project. Now, the last categorization of project that's really important to understand uh, in an inner source context is what I'll call side projects. Side projects have no particular relation at all to my mainline daily work, but may otherwise be important to me. Maybe I'm interested in collaborating on it because it has some new technology that I want to learn. And I think the best way for me to learn that is by working on a project that uses that technology. Uh, or maybe I'm interested uh, for personal uh, reasons uh, besides the technology. Maybe I just think the project is really cool. Uh, for example, and this is kind of a funny one, uh, I was at a company where a team of developers created an internal app uh, that employees and engineers could install. And the app would tell them when there's free food available uh, after uh, a, a conference room had finished with their catering. There's some leftover catering. So there's a leftover catering app. So clearly a side project, like not directly related to my mainline daily work, but nonetheless something I might be interested in collaborating on, right? Now, one thing I want to draw out here is to point out that these categorizations of mainline project, support project, or side project uh, there's not one label that always works for a given project. It's really dependent on the point of view of the person who's interacting with it, right? 
For example, we had talked about that deployment pipeline project. From the point of view of a team building an API service, the deployment pipeline is a support effort, a support project. However, uh, at companies of larger size, they might have an entire team dedicated to maintaining the deployment pipeline, just like my team was that I had talked about earlier. In the context of, of those people, the deployment pipeline is their mainline work, not a support project, right? So different people involved in collaborating can view a particular project through a different, different lens. And particularly in InnerSource, you're always going to have uh, at least two points of view. You have, uh, here I've drawn them on this grid here, you have a guest contributor that's giving code to the project, and then a host team that's receiving the code. And each of them, theoretically, could view the project they're collaborating on uh, through any of these three labels, side, support, or mainline. And given that, the, this grid drawn out nice and neat here, there's um, a number of different flavors of InnerSource uh, with respect to how the guest contributor and the host team uh, view the importance of this project related to their mainline daily work. Now, here on the screen, I've drawn it with nice grid lines, everything clearly defined. Obviously, in real life, things get a little fuzzy. It's not like everything fits into a box. But this general continuum of categorization and some of the conclusions we can draw tends to be useful overall. So this is an important point to understand. Let me go back to what I said earlier, understanding the benefits you're trying to get. It turns out that particular benefits related to InnerSource tend to be associated with certain quadrants or sections of this collaboration grid. Uh, for example, uh, I talked earlier, one result you might want to get is encouraging innovation in the company. If you want to do that, you should focus on getting guest contributors enabled to contribute to side and support projects that are interesting to them. That'll tend to unlock a lot of innovative activity and thoughts on the part of those guest contributors. On the other hand, if your goal is unblocking work, uh, sharing projects uh, through widely and broadly throughout the company, you're going to get a lot of bang for buck by enabling uh, guest contributors to uh, to use and contribute uh, to projects that support their mainline daily work. Okay? So you want to focus on that part of intersource interaction. If you have some important initiative that you want to accelerate, uh, that you want to move forward faster, you need to find ways for teams to host their mainline daily uh, work so that it can be contributed to by guest contributors of all kinds. And then, uh, uh, next here, if you want to increase quality of life, they're significant for your engineering population. It turns out you can hardly go wrong. There are significant quality of life improvements across the whole whole spectrum. So you're probably going to get that. And we see that anecdotally uh, with uh, stories that we hear in the InterSource Commons, and then also with data representing the impact that InterSource has on quality of life. Uh, so that's something that you're, you're going to get in almost all parts here that you focus on. Now. Uh, it turns out also that certain areas of this uh, overall collaboration grid tend to experience similar types of challenges. Uh, so let's go through let's go through those. And this is an, uh, important because you can see what challenges are likely to come up for the parts of this grid where you're targeting uh, some of the gains, some of the benefits to show up. So anytime you have guest contributors that want to contribute to something on the side that's not related to their mainline work, a big challenge is them finding time to do it and their management supporting having that time. Now you as a leader, if this area of contribution is really important to you, there's things that you can do and there's uh, patterns in the inner source commons community about how to set up where people have this time and can have that time protected. But it's something that you want to get ahead of, that you want to be proactive about. Uh, anytime you have uh, guest contributors that need to work on anything uh, that's not their mainline daily work or job, discovery is a big uh, challenge that needs to be overcome. Right? How do I even know what's out there so I'm able to act as an inner source contributor? And again, there's patterns and stories of how to do that, but as a leader, that's something that you'll want to uh, enable so you can see collaboration in this in this area. Now, anytime. Uh, there's a guest contributor <clears throat> that's targeting or thinking about contributing to a project where the team hosting it is less invested than they are. Uh, that's an area where that guest contributor 
tends to have a lack of confidence uh, in the host. Uh, for example, in these squares that I've highlighted here, you have a guest that's working on their mainline daily job uh, in a project that's supported uh, by a host that only views it as a side project or a support project. Uh, again, there's things that you can do. There's patterns you can bring into play to help go give those guest contributors confidence that this is a good place to spend their inner source activity. It's uh, time that's going to be well spent. Um, and that's something that you as a leader can get ahead of and set up. Uh, and then uh, almost across the board, anytime someone is taking their mainline daily work, their mainline project, and accepting any type of guest contribution to it, uh, almost universally, we see all over the place, there's a lack of confidence in, in that guest, a lack of confidence or a concern uh, about the quality of contribution. Uh, and the, the need and the, the utility of spending that time enabling it. And, and again, there's patterns, there's things that you can do about that uh, to show that, to, to lower that. But that's something to be, be aware of. And then finally, uh, lastly here, anytime uh, from a guest contributor or team hosting an, an inner source project perspective, uh, the closer this gets to my mainline daily work or things that support my mainline daily work, just the mechanics of how does this actually work? What are my responsibilities as a guest contributor? You know, what, what are my responsibilities as a, as a team hosting a project? Just the mechanics of that tend to be a challenge. You know, what should I expect of the other side? How does this thing relate to my uh, non-inner source work that I'm doing? All of those questions of mechanics are something that come into play and having a pattern to help to get out in front of that is something that's gonna help you. Now, the neat thing is, and I've tried to reference this as we go along, uh, with these challenges, here I'm, I'm giving you a view. Here's some challenges you can expect depending on which uh, part of the collaboration grid you're targeting for your benefits. Uh, these challenges uh, aren't unique to you. They're not something that you have to solve by yourself. Uh, we can solve them together in the InterSource Commons community. Uh, there are other people at other companies that are experiencing these exact same challenges. And in the InterSource Commons community, we come together to share how we're going about solving them. Uh, through through chat or through writing down patterns about them. Here's some resources uh, the InterSource Commons makes available to you. Uh, first, there's a, a full-time kind of 24-7 running Slack channel uh, as, and Slack team where there's an open chat about anything InterSource. You can find out what other people are doing, ask about your particular situation, get others' advice. And you can get an invite to that Slack channel here at this short URL intersourcecommons.org slash Slack invite. Now, in that, in that Slack, there's a dedicated channel uh, for working groups. And one working group I want to highlight uh, is the Intersource Patterns Working Group. In the Intersource Patterns Working Group, we move beyond talk and chat and actually document strategies for solving specific challenges around Intersource uh, in the context of a, a particular situation at a given company. And those patterns are labeled and tagged so you can see what type of corporate situation uh, this applies. And those patterns have been proven to work at multiple companies. So this is a, a proven way to overcome a specific challenge. Uh, there's a library of dozens of inner source patterns uh, that can help you overcome challenges that you'll see. Uh, you can see the completed uh, set of patterns there at that short URL, intersourcecommons.org slash patterns. You can also find the Intersource Patterns Working Group channel uh, in that same, uh, that same Slack above. There's a separate channel for that. Uh, the next working group I want to highlight where you, we come together to solve these problems, uh, to document how to overcome these challenges, is the Intersource Learning Path Working Group. In this working group, we produce uh, both video and written training, uh, each explaining one particular Intersource uh, concept, one particular aspect of Intersource. Uh, these videos are short, just five minutes. Uh, the written uh, article is uh, just about a page or so in length. So there's things that you can consume and learn just in a single sitting you, without having to allocate time in advance. Uh, you can just pop open the video article and then, and then watch it or, or read it. So we collaborate on those as an open source uh, project. So you can see the finished a set of video trainings uh, and written articles at this short URL, intersourcecommons.org slash learning path. Uh, we're not done making them yet. Um, you can almost think of them as a more kind of curated uh, version of a pattern, but in video form. 
And also there's a Slack channel where you can get involved in the working group that's producing more of these learning path segments. So putting it all together, uh, let me show how you might use these concepts to get started in your journey on InnerSource. And I'll, I'll do it with myself as an example when I'm working on at Nike. Uh, first, as I said, pick the goal, pick the benefit that you want to see from InnerSource and see where it shows up on this grid that I showed you. Now, for me at Nike, the big thing that I'm trying to get is uh, unblocking people's work, sharing projects more broadly. So that's the, kind of the section I'm interested in, particularly on people's uh, uh, mainline work and uh, projects that support the mainline work. So that's the section of grid that I'm interested in. What I do then is uh, look back through and find what are the challenges that overlap these areas of the grid that I where I want to target collaboration. So I've got a few. Uh, I know that uh, I've got to get teams that are hosting their mainline work as inner source. I've got to have it where they have confidence in guest contributors. So I've got work to do there. Uh, I need to make sure that guest contributors can discover what's being put out there in the inner source ecosystem by the host host team. So I'm going to have to come come across and do discovery uh, at some point. Uh, and also, uh, I just need to make the mechanics clear uh, when guest contributors and host teams are interacting. Uh, what are the mechanics of what each should expect of the other? What are the responsibilities of each? Again, how does this relate to non inner source work? How does it relate to the, our agile organization and the sprints that happen? So there's some work to do in those, those mechanics. So what I would do first is knowing that I'm going to have these challenges, I would look to the inner source commons community and what I can learn there. And it turns out there's already documented patterns in this area of discovery, patterns around how to create a portal for inner source projects to create a marketplace uh, for people to accept gigs to contribute to, uh, to inner source projects, ways of scoring active repositories uh, to make them, make them more discoverable. So there's some already some existing learnings that can get me jump started. Uh, again, I need to have those host teams, they need to have confidence in the guest contributors. Again, there's patterns around that. Uh, the 30-day warranty pattern, common requirements pattern, trusted committer pattern, and even learning past segments, uh, video training on trusted committer. Uh, so there's helps for me there. Uh, and my last, uh, my last uh, challenge to overcome uh, that I had shown, just the mechanics of kind of at a nuts and bolts level, how does this work? There's great content there in the existing learning path sections, giving an introduction to inner source, explaining the key roles of contributor and product owner. It's a pattern around the mechanics of setting up a dedicated community leader to, uh, to facilitate uh, guest contributors coming in. So there's already a lot there for me, and I can work on future challenges uh, in the InterSource Commons community as I'm working on getting started in InterSource uh, at my company. So this will give you an idea of what challenges will come, an idea of what solutions you'd like to see. Uh, at that point, you need to actually roll out the solution so people start adopting it. And this puts us squarely in the realm of culture change, enterprise cult culture change. Now, if you've tried to get people to change their behavior at a broad scale in an organization, uh, you realize it's not something easy. It's something that's tough. Now, fortunately, the nature of the difficulty of people adopting an inner source culture uh, runs along and has very similar patterns with all types of corporate culture change. And there's published research in the area that can help us. We don't have to figure this out totally on our own, uh, for which I'm very thankful. And I've got here on the screen, I've got two uh, books that have been very, very useful to, uh, for me. I want to commend them to you about culture change at, at enterprise scale and how to do it. Uh, the, the one here, More Fearless Change, uh, Strategies for Making Your Ideas Happen. Uh, by Mary Lynn Manns and, and Linda Rising. This book is amazing. It has, uh, it's a book, but you don't have to read the whole book at once. What it has is a set of small uh, three to five page individual patterns about how to change culture and how to change behavior at a broad scale in an organization. Each of these patterns are classified by what conditions, what context they apply. Each of them is just a few pages. It explains very clearly what you can do to advance uh, the change you want to see, given that particular context. It has real life anecdotes, so you can read examples of how that's played out. And every time I've done that, it's very, very obvious to me how I can apply this particular pattern to the problem that I'm, I'm facing or the thing that I, that I, want, to, that I want to roll out. Uh, so more fearless change uh, is fantastic. Now, on the, in the other book, 
Dr. Damon Santola with How Behavior Spreads has documented very academically uh, principles uh, that culture change initiatives uh, in any uh, social, large social environment like a corporation that they need to follow. Uh, there's a lot of academic uh, style research there. The basic premise is that culture change is not automatic and does not come by hearing the need to make a change. So you can't just tell people what inner source is and expect them to do it just because you told them. Culture change and behavior change in a social context like a company uh, absolutely needs for a given team, a given individual to make a change. They need to see multiple points of reinforcement around them, uh, reinforcing that this change is okay. It can be people telling them it's okay. It can be that they see other people that are adopting the specific change, you know, like running my project as an inner source project. You know, for example, that would be a change. Multiple points of sustained reinforcement are required. And the reason why these patterns and more fearless change work is because they all respect this principle, probably un unknowingly at the time, but they all respect this principle that Dr. Santola lays out so clearly. And uh, a simple rule that we have at Nike for uh, putting this into practice is something that I'll share with you. And we'll, we'll kind of wrap up here, uh, is the two, two, one rule, okay? So when we're working with a particular uh, team, a particular individual, and we want them to adopt some aspect of open collaboration, we want them to adopt some aspect of inner source, we know we need to do more than just teach them the need to do it. Uh, we can talk till we're blue in the face about how great it's gonna be, but if we don't respect what we learned uh, you know, from Dr. Sintola and, uh, and Dr. Manns and Dr. Rising, uh, it's, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna stick. So the two, two, one rule uh, says that we have two points of reinforcement uh, kind of vertically from their management chain, letting them know that whatever change we're asking them to make, again, maybe to start running their project as an inner source project or start checking out projects to contribute. Uh, whatever message it is that we want them to act on, we work with their leadership so that two of their leaders uh, in, their, in their hierarchy let them know that they think it's a good idea. They make space for it. They say, I, I support this, I support you finding projects to contribute to. I support you running your project as an inner source project. So just verbally, they've had two points of reinforcement vertically. Uh, then we hit them from the side also, and we have two of their peers also give that same message. Okay? Uh, again, uh, this is something good, it's something I do, it's something I've been successful with, it's something I think is a good idea. Again, whatever the thing is, you know, running the project as an inner source project or having a clean uh, readme or whatever behavior we, we want them to adopt. Uh, so two, two, and then one, we make sure that they're aware of one project that successfully adopted this new behavior that, that we want them to do. Again, maybe they started running themselves as an inner source project and they've been successful. Uh, we track through data and through anecdote the success of people that are adopting inner source and open collaboration habits. And we make sure that as we're evangelizing to new people, that we have an, a shining example that we can hold up of a project that they've heard before, or a person they've heard before that's adopted it and that they're aware that it's successful, okay? So that's the two, two, uh, one rule. Two points of reinforcement vertically, two points of reinforcement horizontally, and then uh, uh, verbal reinforcement, you know, vertically and horizontally, and then one uh, success story uh, where it's actually produced the desired results. And that's worked very well for us. Now, obviously we can't like go to every single person at the company or every team of the company and like custom set two, two, one for all of them. So what we do is usually grab an entire subtree of the org, usually one to 300 people is our target range. And we'll set up with leadership of these one to 300 people to make sure that there's two of the leaders, two of the peers that are in that, that set of one to 300 people and one notable project. So we'll go through about these batches of about that size, one to 300 people, and we do two, two, one on each of them, and that gets the culture change started. That's something that's been successful for us. Uh, so uh, just in summary, we talked about uh, quite a bit here. I have encouraged you to think about inner source as a journey. Like any good journey, you should know the destination, like what's the benefit you're trying to get out of it. And with that, you can plot that on this categorization grid that I've shared with you about how a guest and a host uh, team involved in resource about how they think about the project they're collaborating on. Is it a side support or mainline project? Uh, with that, you can see what types of inner source interactions 
uh, you want to enable to get the benefit you're going for. And you can get a look ahead at the types of challenges that you're probably going to get given the types of intersource interactions that you're setting up. Now, you don't need to overcome those challenges on your own. Work in the Intersource Commons community, work in the Slack channels, work in the patterns working group uh, and the learning path to get ideas of what to do. And then when you roll those out, respect these principles of culture change that come in the More Fearless Change um, uh, book uh, uh, and the uh, How Behavior Spreads book. And one easy way to do that is with that 2 2 one uh, rule. Uh, so that's it. That's what I got for you. Uh, thanks so much. And I'm really looking forward to hear from you in the Intersource Commons how it goes as you get started in your journey to Intersource.